Hello, and welcome back to the Burr Channel, where we talk about whatever I want, and I stream on twitch.tv slash ginzy. Today we're going to talk about the length of video games, because I got mad about my indecisiveness in an open world game one too many times. And because I am the way that I am, I'll also give you a little bit of video game history. I do recognize the irony of this being a long video. Bear with me. Gather around the fire, and let me tell you a tale. When I was a wee lass, games were not long. In fact, they couldn't really be long. There wasn't enough space on the cartridge to be of particularly long length. Instead, video games would be mildly frustrating, implement lives to limit the amount of times you could try again, and dump you back at the very beginning of the game once you ran out of those ever-precious lives, until you'd beg your older sibling to come and finish that one level you can't get past. Though in the before times you couldn't even play your games at home, you could only play games in the arcades, and arcades made it their business to ensure you lose the game as often as possible, in order to devour more of your coins. However, when the Magnavox Odyssey home console eventually took its first few steps into the video game market, alongside Pong and home computers, the floodgates were well and truly opened. We had floppy disks to work with, also introduced around the same time. At this point, no more than a save icon for a lot of the younger generation, and a reminder of the cruel passage of time for fossils like myself, but it used to be one of our main ways of accessing video games. All 80 kilobytes of them. Yes, that tiny. Even later down the line, when the NES released and Mario Brothers introduced the world to stomping on wildlife for fun, the size of their cartridges only ranged from 8 kilobytes to a whole megabyte for some. But now that video games were finally here, JRPGs had to get started at some point, and they were dead set to fill up every kilobyte they could get their hands on. I hope you didn't think we'd have a video about game length without mentioning JRPGs. Final Fantasy, one of the most well-known series in the West, was not the first one either. Technically, that was a game called Underground Exploration by Koei in 1982. And although it doesn't quite look like what we're used to these days, it was barely what we'd call an RPG at all, it had all the basics already. A band of misfits that look suspiciously like simple dots on a grid travel to a weird world where they fight monsters of also suspiciously simple dot-like appearance, equip new gear, and win life, presumably. Marcus is trying to find the princess in this castle here. Uh-huh. But he doesn't know that the princess was swapped with a demon and mm -hmm. actually his wife is in another castle altogether, threatened by the turtle overlord. They still look like dots to me. His wife is in distress, John. I couldn't tell you for sure because in the West we never got our hands on this game. Koei was left to find its footing in Japan with a different JRPG called Danchizuma no Yuaku, roughly translating to Seduction of Condominium Wives, where you play a condom salesman who fights ghosts and Yakuza while trying to sleep with women. The game had actual color and was a huge hit. Also an RPG, by the way. Anyway, our first RPG would have been Hidlead. Hidlead. Would have been. Because technically Hidlead. Hidlead. Released well before Final Fantasy and even Dragon Quest, two juggernaut JRPGs. But Japan didn't release the English version for another five years in early 1990 for the US and 1991 in Europe. This is a trend that didn't die for a very long time. They really hate Europe because we speak too many languages. So instead, we got Dragon Quest, then known as Dragon Warrior, before Hidlead. Maybe it's pronounced Hidlead, but who knows? In 1989, with Final Fantasy hot on its feet in 1990. And against those two, Hidlead didn't stand a solitary chance. Having said that, Hidlead wouldn't really fit today's topic either way because you can beat it in three to four hours. Whereas Dragon Quest sat around 10 to 12 hours, and Final Fantasy clocked in at a rough 17 to 25. And here's the thing, that's very long. You just heard me talk about shorter games. An hour to three hours was a rough estimate for most games. They had to be shorter, not just because of the size of the game cartridges, but also because saving didn't really exist until The Legend of Zelda in 1987. Zelda, a game that immediately became much longer at a rough 10-hour length. Instead of saves, games used to have passwords. Once you got past a certain level, the game gave you a sometimes weirdly long and 
unfortunately pixelated combination of buttons to press that would allow you to quickly move on to that particular level. In the case of Golden Sun 2, it would even allow you to import your Golden Sun 1 game, including all of your accomplishments, some of which actually affected your Golden Sun 2 playthrough. As long as you were willing to write down and eventually input 260 characters, or you could pay Nintendo a bunch of money for a link cable and an extra Game Boy to directly transfer the file. Devious. Previous games allowed you to save high scores, but never midway progress. Having a built-in save system opened the second set of floodgates. Longer games became more prevalent, and a lot of them were of the RPG kind. And that makes sense when you think about the core elements of an RPG. Generally, they have a story with a solid beginning, middle, and end. They'll have items to boost your strength, characters to level up, mini-games, side quests, card collections, pets to bond with, solo careers to start, and a way to explore the new world you've entered in an effort to become as powerful as possible before you inevitably defeat that universe's god, followed by the real, actual for serious super god final battle. Although that last bit might only apply to JRPGs specifically. All things that, when rushed, would make the game feel incomplete and unrewarding. Other game genres didn't veer into long form until much later. I distinctly remember a few years of Disney releasing a slew of mini-game-focused games on PC and other platforms. I could spend hours in Timon and Pumbaa's jungle games and it didn't take up much space, but their platformers like Maui Mallard in Cold Shadow, another one of my favorites, was still only about four hours. Many other well-loved games were point-and-click, like The Curse of Monkey Island. The pattern here is interactive pictures. We just didn't have the processing power for epic, sprawling, graphically intensive worlds yet. One of the first examples of such a world was Myst in 1993. The graphics of Myst were the main attraction. It looked beautiful for its time. It's a puzzle game of the kind that will make you feel very silly for missing the clue in their beautiful scenery, but it lets you explore and think at your own pace so you never feel rushed to do anything, making it an extremely relaxed experience. Yes, still very point and click, but the tone was set. Myst became the best-selling PC game quickly, and it held that title for years until The Sims eventually outsold them. Importantly, it also drove more interest towards using CD-ROMs. Up until that point, we'd still been using floppy disks for a good chunk of our video gaming needs, with some CDs. But CDs could hold hundreds of times their data, so it made sense to switch entirely. Consoles decided to take advantage of the new disks as well. Philips was one of the first with their CDI. You know, the one with the Zelda memes. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. Sorry, Link. I can't give credit. Come back when you're a little... Mm, richer. You're not afraid of dragons, are you? You're doing great, Link. Hey, Zelda, wake up! What, Link? You are my prisoner. Hey! Silence! <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they didn't really break any records. The Turbo Graphics released a CD upgrade soon after and became the top-selling console in Japan, but nowhere else. Because in North America and Europe, the Sega Genesis started selling the Sega CD add-on. Something a lot of consoles did back then was create their consoles with an add-on slot, just in case. Like the Nintendo 64 adding the 64DD, so you could play floppy disks on them in 1999. That didn't last long, and we would never see the release of Cabbage, a 64DD exclusive breeding game. But no one would do CDs like Sony would do CDs, and thus the floodgates would open a third time for a whole host of hours upon hours long RPGs. With ever more data available, games would grow and become more beautiful than ever. Wonderful worlds in Zelda on the Nintendo, Kingdom Hearts on the PlayStation, Halo on Xbox. It was all dazzling and engaging until Assassin's Creed released. Okay, yes, Assassin's Creed was also fun and dazzling and engaging, because this was the first one, and open-world games everywhere hadn't adopted all of its traits like an incestuous Crusader King's Union just yet. There had been large open worlds before Assassin's Creed, don't get me wrong, but this was a template. You had a large map, and that map had little points of interest on them. 
Once you got to the point of interest that revealed the surrounding map, more little points of interest would be revealed. And then you could go and collect those little points of interest. Assassin's Creed has 420 collectible flags to find. Once you find them all, you get nothing. Absolutely nothing. An achievement, I guess. The developer allegedly put them in the game as a joke. He didn't think anyone would actually bother collecting them. A meta commentary on pointless collectibles. They were told to add collectibles, so they did. And unfortunately, it stuck around. Assassin's Creed was successful. So was GTA. Everyone thought Zelda's open world was great. And it was. So they wanted one too. And it sold gangbusters. The gaming world had found the ideal way to stretch game time. Collectibles, hidden secrets, bonus items, and all of that in a sprawling open world where you had to look around for quite a while until you found them all. Maps were no longer just there to travel through. Every inch of every open world had to be covered in collectibles. Preferably multiple. After all, Assassin's Creed didn't just have flags. You could also get an achievement for killing all 60 of the available Templars. Just like the flags, that didn't give you anything save for a static picture. And yes, previously we had collectible coins in Mario or Skultalas in Zelda, but collecting those gave you something tangible in the end. Mostly. The Skultalas in Ocarina of Time are debatable after a certain point. An upgrade of some kind awaited at the end of the grind. Even Donkey Kong 64's collectibles had an eventual reward, but Assassin's Creed was incredibly successful. So we filled those maps. Every inch had to have something to pick up. Not something worthwhile, necessarily, just something. Often enough, games didn't really know what to put somewhere, so they dump in resources of some kind. They couldn't cut the area, we need a big open world map. It, it has to be big. Bigger every time. Look at the vistas. All right, new game pitches. John, big open world. Good start. And, no, that's it. Just do that. John, what's in the open world? Openness. Openness. Are you suggesting a sandbox open world game where players create their own content using basic building tools provided largely by mods also created by the players themselves? Sure, yeah, whatever. I hate it here. And these secret, well-hidden collectibles weren't fun easter eggs anymore. Some clever callback or an in-joke between the gamers. They were just there so you could engage in busy work. The point now was to get you to play as long as possible because that's something to boast about. Some games do this well because they make traversing the world incredibly satisfying. Games like Marvel Spider-Man make swinging around New York fun and engaging, so looking around for collectibles is almost natural. You want to see more of the city, you want to move around in it because you're Spider-Man and swinging on webs makes all the pixel children think you're cool. The Witcher 3 has collectibles on the map as well, but almost all of them include a note or a small quest to make going there interesting and immersive. Except the Skelliger points of interest. It is absolutely vital they die in a righteous fire. Because those Skelliger points illustrate the problem perfectly. The waterbound points of interest were brought up in an interview once and Philip Weber, if I mispronounced your name, I'm very sorry, but also you put points of interest in the Skelliger water, so I think I have a little bit of moral leeway here. Still a junior quest designer at the time, mentioned that those points of interest weren't really meant to exist initially, but they ran out of time to fill the map with something more meaningful than waterlocked treasure, so the chests they originally implemented as fun little secrets to run into while you traveled became fully-fledged points of interest. The map had to be filled. And if your map wasn't filled, your game wasn't good enough. Because when you think about it, a lot of those open-world games really wouldn't be quite as long without all the side collectible stuff. The Witcher 3, on average, is about 50 hours in terms of main story. 33-odd hours if you rush. Still very long, mind you, but main story plus extras, like side quests and such, is around 100 hours. That's extremely long. Completionists get to add another 66 hours to their total. 
Pretty sure 30 of those are Skellige diving. The point is, if your map isn't filled, it means you spend less time in the game. And that's not something we want. Why not? Well, I couldn't tell you for certain, but we're here to speculate a little. Steam has a few ways of prioritizing new games. First, wishlisting. It's like commenting on a YouTube video. If you want a YouTube video to do well, you leave a comment of about one sentence. If you want a game to do well, you wishlist it. Doing that will boost it in the popular upcoming widget on the store's front page. Other metrics include the amount of reviews left and, of course, sales. But there's one other. You already know where this is going. Playtime! Of course it's playtime. Apparently, Steam users don't like short games, even when those games are otherwise very good and enjoyable. I think back to the release of Cult of the Lamb, a cute little game that I enjoyed tremendously. One of the earlier negative reviews on its page read as follows. That's of course not to say the game is terrible, it's absolutely not. I had my fun with it, and the soundtrack, visuals, and dialogue were all very good. But after finishing the game in just 17 hours, that means that for the price I paid, $19.49, that equals out to less than an hour of playtime per pound spent. Does that seem worth it to you? Think of the amount of hours you can squeeze out of Isaac or Hades. No, I didn't misread Isaac. That's a direct quote. 17 hours. 17 hours isn't enough time in a game. I would like to focus your attention on the way they phrase their final sentence. Think of the amount of hours you can squeeze out of Isaac or Hades. Squeeze out of. That's what we're doing now. That's what the gamers are doing now. We're not looking at how enjoyable our time was. That's secondary. How much playtime can we squeeze out of our purchase, for better or for worse? We've moved to an hours per dollar rate. I'm absolutely not saying a person can't decide for themselves whether or not they think their time was well spent. Of course they can. Maybe your ideal game is simply a hundred hours long. In which case, might I draw your attention to JRPGs and also Skyrim. But the idea that a game's length is the ideal and only metric that merits any worth feels off to me. But Steam incentivizes it anyway. More playtime means more visibility on Steam. More visibility on Steam means more eyeballs on your game, means more sales. And that's even more important now that most games are sold online almost exclusively. Many box copies you buy in physical stores don't have a disc in them anymore. They just have a download code. First they came for my manuals, and now this. Hell, even when there is a disc, that disc is often just there to activate a download. The disc itself doesn't really contain the game. Many games have gotten too big to be contained on a single disc anyway, or sometimes even several discs. The biggest CD held 870 MB. DVD? 17 gigs. Blu-ray? 128 gigs. Your PC? Potentially several terabytes. Plenty of current day PCs don't even come with a disk drive anymore. They're truly ripping everything physical out of my life. And that's not strange, because we have patches now. We have DLCs now. Not just sometimes, but always. Doom Eternal required 50 gigs of free space on launch, and then we got the extras, so now it requires 89 gigs. Every game has achievements nowadays, and the achievements generally require you to play the game to a 100% status. I've been stuck on my final achievement for Bloodstained for ages now because I didn't want to replay the majority of the game again. Even though it's a very good game, and you should play it, especially if you enjoy Castlevania. And that's the crux, really. The amount of hours you can spend in a game doesn't equate to the amount of hours most regular people would or even want to, but they'll put it in anyway. When it comes to most games, I'll play through the game for the story or the main objective, and then I'll largely put it down. But game length is such a big deal these days that that's not what developers want you to do. The Dying Light 2 developers claimed that the game would require 500 hours to complete at 100%. 
Casual players would take around 70 to 80 hours. It was one of their big pulls, in fact. They made a comparison between completing the game and walking from Warsaw to Madrid, which would take you 534 hours, and also doesn't sound like something I'd actually want to do. They had to backtrack a little later down the line when people called them out on this claim, because actually, the game's main story would only take about 20 hours. Just a small discrepancy, really. Tiny, barely noticeable. The 500 number comes from the main story plus side quests, while also seeing all choices and all endings, checking every single corner of the map, seeing every piece of dialogue, and, of course, finding every collectible out there. Without question, that would require multiple playthroughs with only very minor changes, and I can't see even the most hardcore fans get out of bed for that. But clearly, they did think this 500 hours number was a good selling point. This was a positive to them, because the industry has taught us that gamers like long games. All gamers love long games. Or at the very least, the vast majority does. So just make the longest game possible and you're fine. It doesn't matter where the hours come from, as long as we can brag about them. It doesn't exactly breed a streamlined experience, of course, but streamlined experiences are for losers and select indie titles. In fact, it breeds the opposite. It breeds convoluted open worlds and live services. When it comes to playtime, live services are the golden goose. Everyone wants to have one these days. Even studios that really weren't ever about the online perpetual gameplay loop, like Bioware. I still think back to Anthem and wonder if it could have been good had they only scrapped the live service angle and just built an immersive story-driven world where we get to choose what fantasy character and or alien we hook up with from a plethora of interesting, well-written individuals. And we're definitely going to pick a different romance option for our next playthrough, obviously. Except we don't, because the writing was so good we got emotionally attached to our nerdy space boy with mandibles and... Where was I going with this? Anyway, I wonder what would have happened if they'd made that. You know, the thing they're good at. But for studios, it's so important to keep us playing to keep their playtime on Steam high, to keep us coming back to their game and their game alone, so we can buy things from their cash shop or their season passes. They don't care if their product might not be as good as it could be. They want your time and attention. They want you to get your friends to join you in this game. It's a mad scramble for eyeballs, and the funny thing about incredibly long games is most people don't even finish them. Film Otter made an excellent video on the topic of how and why that is some time ago that I'll link in the description as well, and I highly recommend you give that a watch after this one too. But no, most people don't finish or even start long games. I'm a big Witcher fan and will always tell anyone new to at least give them a go. Start with The Witcher 3 since that one's the most well-rounded out of the set. When I bring that up on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Jinzy, I get the same response from a lot of people. I want to get into it, but I don't have the time to start a game that long. I tried it once, but I got overwhelmed with the size of the map. There's too many choices. I'd rather just watch someone else play it. And The Witcher 3 is really good. If you haven't played it yet yourself and feel a little overwhelmed, I usually suggest purely focusing on the main story quest and putting your blinders on when it comes to side quests. Please play The Witcher. A game can be absolutely amazing. The best thing since sliced bread and Garrus Vicarian, but if the very idea of starting it is too daunting, many simply won't even try. I bought Fire Emblem Three Houses about two years or so ago. On average, people spend about 50 hours in it, but completionists can spend as much as 200 hours because the game has branching paths. That means the replayability to see different outcomes is pretty high. I still haven't started playing it, even though I was excited about it. But every time I thought about playing it, I rationalized that I wouldn't really have the time to sink into it now, so I, I should wait until I do. The problem is, I won't have that kind of time until I retire, if I retire at all. I haven't had that kind of time since high school, and the same goes for many of us. My ideal game now is something I can pick up and put down with relative ease, or a game short enough that I don't have to worry about forgetting how to play after some time. And I'm sure I'd be fine playing Three Houses if I actually started it up and played a little every so often, but it's a barrier. It's a feeling of apathy that begins when I think about the hours I could spend in the game. Play me!
I'm new and refreshing. You've had me on your wish list for months before the sale finally hit. No, play me. I've been in your backlog for over a year now. You love games like me. You know you do. But I'm an old classic that people have said you should play. And I'm already installed. Why not give me a go instead? You're going to play me again. Don't give them hope, you silly thing. <laughs> Every time. Some games I play feel like I've only played an hour when in reality I've been there for several days. I forgot to eat and my cats have started eating my left eyeball. I'll be on stream suddenly wondering how it got to be stream end again already. Didn't we just start? That's because I'm having fun. In that same vein, there are games that feel like a genuine slog. Those hundred hours it's supposed to last? Yes, I feel them. And because of these strange playtime requirements, a lot of games try to truly make it last as long as possible. Dragon Age Inquisition has a mechanic called the War Table. It's a map you can use to select missions with. Those missions give you rewards like side quests, zones, and they're often little stories in and of themselves. But they run in real time. That means you might accept a quest that takes only 15 minutes in real time to complete, which is manageable. Or you might have to wait 19 hours and 12 minutes. It's optional content, technically, but they're really hoping it'll keep you hooked just a little longer anyway. And there are plenty time stretch mechanics available. A popular one nowadays is crafting. Crafting usually takes quite a bit of time because you have to look up the recipe, materials, focus on collecting them, not to mention how convoluted most crafting systems are even more so when a game is long to begin with. A lot of games I've played that have crafting have made the mechanic obsolete as well by providing the player with high power drops outside of crafting too. Talent points and skill allocations that don't change the gameplay whatsoever, level scaling in progression-based games alongside enemies that are nothing but damage sponges, weight limits to your inventory, most stealth mechanics, collectathon fetch quests, non-skippable cutscenes, and forced RP walks. All of them naturally stretch gameplay, and sometimes games incorporate all of those things at once. So, let's talk about the longest game for a bit. It's not 500 hours long, it's 400 days long. There is a game called The Longing. The Longing is a game about waiting, about time passing. It's extremely long, or at least it markets itself as such, 400 days. In actuality, it doesn't take that long at all. It only does if you don't play the game. Sounds counterintuitive, I know. The game runs on perceived time. The little shade you control is very bored, because all it has is depression and the constant feeling of dread that comes with living in a society, like most millennials. So if you do nothing at all, then yes, the game will take 400 days to complete, as the shade sits alone in the cave with no one to talk to and nothing to do, because it's the start of 2019, presumably. But if you do play, if you give the shade a nice little home, explore around, do little puzzles to make its life more bearable, then time will pass more quickly. Literally, time flies when you're having fun. Technically, to complete the longing, you could start the game and close it immediately after. Time keeps ticking while the game is closed, much like idle games do. You'll come back in 400 days to awaken the king as instructed, and there you go, you've completed the game. But that's obviously not the point of the game. It doesn't have to last 400 hours, it's what you make of it. Giving the shade things to do or look at makes time pass faster, yes, but it also makes them happy. To start off, they have a little home with a comfortable chair, some books, a table to draw on, and a hearth. However, it's all incredibly basic. There aren't very many books in your bookcase, the fire isn't lit, and you have no way of lighting it. The only thing you can use to draw is a piece of black charcoal and very few pieces of paper. The shade doesn't smile, save when you sit them down in the chair with a nice book. But as the little cave is filled with pictures, a bed, crystals and rugs, the shade eventually starts to smile while walking around the room. They're happy. It takes some time to collect all these items, of course. The game is still very much about patience, so your shade walks very slowly. Sometimes a path is blocked and you have to wait a month for some water to fill a pit in order to swim through it. And as you come back each time to painstakingly collect more items, you start to get attached to the little shade that's always there, waiting, mumbling to the darkness, wondering about the future. The longing is a long game. 
It's in the title, but that time has a point. It's part of what the game is trying to convey. Although you don't have very much to do each day, it doesn't overstay its welcome. You can cover your walls in pictures to make time speed up immensely. You can, but you don't have to. You can collect all the books, but you don't have to. It doesn't ask you to clear the map. It doesn't ask you to collect all the points of interest. There are no markers, no quest objectives, and no mini-maps. It doesn't ask you anything save to mind the time. And that's the difference. A long game doesn't feel long if it's good. If what you're doing in the game is fun and meaningful, even when it's a game about waiting that, for me, clicked, although I know it won't for everyone, if instead you sigh at yet another collect 10 bear asses quest, it starts to feel like a slog. Time moves one second at a time indeed. Long games aren't automatically bad, short games aren't automatically good. Games with meaningful content are good. Games put together without thought and a single-minded aim to elongate the gameplay as much as possible have a pretty high likelihood of being disappointing. I initially started up the longing because I'd heard of the 400 days thing and figured it'd be a good example of an idler game, perhaps. Something you don't really get invested in, but just leave running because you're collecting mindless things like Cookie Clicker. And I'm so sorry to have reminded you of Cookie Clicker just now. Do not play that game. Resist. You're better than that. For a game that is ostensibly just about waiting, I got very attached to my shade. I wanted them to be comfortable. And no, the gameplay isn't very energetic. The game still revolves around time, patience and waiting. If you're wondering about said gameplay, you've seen most of it as background footage by now. One of the first things the game does is give you a door that opens very slowly. which is really just an appetizer for a door later down the line that takes two hours to open. So what do you do then? You wait. The Longing isn't a game you play actively. It's something that exists in your peripheral vision, and every so often you come back to see what your little shade is up to. Because this game does have an end. Once your 400 days are gone, that's it. Your game is over. Say goodbye to the shade. But you can even end the game well before then. You just have to actively explore and engage with the game. Being alone with your thoughts and your new friend is the point. That and googling very rational things like, it's day 100 and the ceiling hasn't caved in yet? What am I doing wrong? I just want books. The time it takes to do anything is the point, but it does have an end. As opposed to many other idle games that have no end. They loop infinitely and keep you coming back for more because you wouldn't want to miss that daily bonus login looking at you. Basically, all mobile games ever made. The hallmark of a good game, at least to me, is that it respects my time. A game can be long. It can be 500 hours long, and that's fine. As long as all 500 of those hours feel worth playing. As long as I don't get told to walk from one end of the map to the other end of the map purely to stretch for time, when the quest in question could have been a phone call. Length should never be the only goal. But as sad as it is, developers get judged on length regardless of quality. Even when they'd rather make a three-hour game, they're better off going for the 10-hour mark at least. I've played hour-long games that stuck with me for years after. The Witcher 2, purported to be the shortest Witcher game, was the game that quite literally saved my life. I've also played 100-hour games that I forgot about the moment credits rolled, as well as 200-hour games that I love to pieces to this day. I enjoy the longing in the end, although I didn't think I would. And that game has turned waiting into a form of art. I just wish that developers didn't feel like they had to bend over backwards to create more hours out of thin air to please the invisible hand of the algorithm. Much like YouTubers who live and die by how many people comment on their videos. I've played a lot of games over the years that could have been shorter. The side quests were lackluster, the areas devoid of purpose, but they were added anyway, to meet a time quota. Something they could point towards when the gamers got mad at how short their game was. And when a game doesn't do that, when a game only allows itself to be as long as the creators feel it needs to be, their reckoning comes in the form of reviews that only mention time and Steam metrics that don't measure up to the big leagues. For me, 
If a 10-minute game could give me an experience that stayed with me forever, then I feel it is worth playing. I feel it is worth paying for. Because to create something so impactful requires a great deal of skill, creativity, time and effort. I understand that this won't be the same for everyone and that plenty of people have to consider what product will give them the most hours of enjoyment per dollar spent. Having said that, I don't think that means we should all take however many hours we can squeeze out of a game purely for the sake of being able to say, wow, really got my money's worth in hours. Too bad I was bored for 90% of them. So yes, I'm afraid my title was a fraud, because what the length of a game says about the game itself is exactly nothing, save how much time you might conceivably spend playing it. You cannot tell if the game will be fun. You cannot tell if the game will have bugs, look good or bad, have great voice acting, or someone yelling through a tin can. The length of a game is largely irrelevant, at least that is my personal opinion. And in my equally personal opinion, I actually prefer shorter games most days. Not because of quality concerns, but because I'm easily overwhelmed by open-world content. It makes me not want to choose to play them. That's not to say short games are automatically good, of course. They might fall short, huh, in terms of storytelling, or their premise is too bare bones to really build anything engaging with. But at least I'll know that a lot sooner than I would in a JRPG. What about you? Do you prefer long or short games, and why? And if you do have recommendations for any three to six hour length story games, let me know. I'm always looking, specifically if they're indie games. Thank you to my patrons and Kofi cats who make these videos possible. And an extra special thank you to I Save One, One's the Loneliest, Laser, Robertson, Wall Guy the Robin, Coolsta, Danvers, Septic, Adrian Packle, and Ray Ray for going above and beyond until another tale finds us.